you know, some sometimes this conference we finish and we leave, and there is there is no kind of sense of, um, you know, what 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 is the takeaway? You know, how how we 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 go to to our own uh, home back? Uh, what is the what is the result of that conference? And usually we just go in our own. And we thought with Yoshi that a good way to finish uh, this this uh, two days uh, was to have kind of common. Uh, time in which you could, could together kind of have a kind of ref reflectivity going back to Tom a point uh, and begin to kind of raise uh, issues and what we have learned, what the insight, what are the problems or the issues uh, that we want to continue um, discussing in the future. So uh, in order for them to do that, there is probably no perfect way, but uh, what we're going to do um, is going to uh, First, ask each uh, speaker or panelist that participated in the symposium to give, and I'm, I'm going to take the minute, one minute on the spot, um, what you learned or what uh, ideas you are taking home or uh, what issue you, know, you, you want to kind of bring to our attention or what questions. Um, again, it's one minute, so you know, no, nobody needs to look particularly smart at this. Um, I think it's just a train of consciousness and see how it goes. During that time, what I asked the audience, so they are participating as well, because I mean, you participated by paying attention, you change whatever you heard into your own self. Um, what I'd like you to do, or not just the audience uh, as, as a non-speaker, but everybody is invited to write in a paper, a piece of paper that hopefully you have now you received uh, one question or two if you want it, uh, and then pass it along on this side to this uh, part of the uh, uh, the stairs, and then the same here. Uh, one of my graduate students, my research assistant, will uh, take it uh, to Yoshi. He's going to be the grand censor uh, person, censorship. Um, he will, he's going to select a few questions that we're going to raise so we can have a conversation in general. Not all questions are created equal, I guess. Um, but I think it's important to to, to raise issues that um, we could we could spend time. So that's the plan. Um, so unless somebody object, uh, many of us don't have something to write in. Okay, so somebody uh, be generous and and yeah and and do that. So this is going to take a little bit of moving, which I'm happy to do. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start from that side, from the right. To the left, just because I thought to start from the left to the right, but I'm going to start from the right to the left. So the first person that is going to have the the honor to say anything is Suchi, which she doesn't she doesn't quite know that she's going to get it. So um, one minute, you you are going to be the first one. <laughs> I switch. I, I do you want to time it? Yeah. Uh, you have one minute. If there's one thing I know about Julio is that he'll put you on the spot and he's, you know, yeah, that's one thing I know about you. Okay. So um, I guess my question really goes back to what Muhammad raised um, when we were responding to Michael. And I'm still thinking about, because this is a conversation I also want to have with Yoshio later, um, but really about this idea of mystic experience and architecture. And can we translate that? Because for me, really, that's my end, end, end goal that I kind of want to get to. And I know that sounds really crazy, maybe, in this scenario. Um, but I would love to know um, what I can learn from science that might get me there. So that's my, that's my question. She wins only 20 seconds. Thank you. Very fast. Okay, the, you have one minute to say anything about what you learned in this conference, the insight, uh, an issue, uh, criticize it, uh, ask a question. One minute, though. One minute. All right, thank you. So that's one minute for a second. Um, I think I would like to say a few words about what I think was important for me as a researcher coming to this uh, conference. Um, I think it's a bit of an understatement to say how important it is to have a forum in which we can create this basically the passage that was uh, trying to address when I was talking about the passages of neurophenomenology. I think it's um, exceptional actually to be in a, in a conference in which you have some people who do hardcore science and a lot of people who want to understand the outcome of that, because we are informing each other in both directions. And, and I think that 
that would be the uh, bi-directional uh, uh, relationship that I was looking for to improve my research. Um, but at the same time, I'm also um, a bit uh, stuck, struck by, by, for example, Gordon's uh, presentation, because I thought he was very right. There sometimes appears that there, there's some kind of dualism that I also think applies to this group of people in the conference. So I have just a final, just a final question. How do we create the right uh, circumstances to support and criticize each other? And I think this conference is a good answer to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, two things that were, were very, very important for me from this conference, from this experience together, um, were the following. The first one was that I came here for it by the fact, for the fact that I had more questions than answers. And if I understood correctly, it's a good thing, <laughs> not so bad. So we should keep on uh, making questions. Really like when yesterday we saw, we said that probably religion uh, was born because men, people can make questions. So that's why we start this spiritual and sacred experience. And the second thing very, very important for me was I came here not sure about my vocabulary, especially uh, words like resonance, achievement, and I found um, the perfect context to start and discuss these elements to talk more together among neuroscientists and architects. Thank you, Elisabetta. So um, needless to say, this has been an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily enlightening moment for me. Um, as the fish out of water in this group, um, I feel that I've gotten an enormous amount out of it. Uh, rather than ask a question, I'm, there's, I've been sort of um, been uh, plagued with the use of the terms attention and arousal, which pop up in so many of the talks here. So um, at the at the just after the First World War, uh, a, a soldier. Um, a general was concerned about the um, the the number of um, of people hurt in munitions factories, and he had an idea that using music in these munitions factories can reduce the the number of of uh, of accidents. And what he did over time was create a, a horrifying co corporation called Muzak, which um, which for those of you who who you know, go in elevators and hear elevator music, that's that's music. And but what was what was um, amazing about it was that the formula was to separate arousal from attention. So um, so using that formula, he wanted to moderate arousal over the time of the workday and um, and reduce attention. And so I'm just going to plant that idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, something that has struck me very much is that um, neuroscience, neurophenomenology aims to explain. And there is obviously a tremendous capacity in both technological and uh, theoretical and scientific. But there has been less attention given exactly to what it is to be explained. And I've been struck by how terms like sacred architecture, sacred spaces, uh, awe, and so on have been tossed around. And I, I think uh, a much richer description of the thing to be explained is required. And that's not going to be achieved, in my view, simply by a sort of survey of opinion. It has to be historically informed and anthropologically informed. So I think uh, this the side of the Explanations. The explanation is, is is pretty much in place. I mean, with a lot of very sophisticated, but the side of the explanations needs more careful attention and both more precision uh, than perhaps it's had. Thank you. Are you going to take your own time, uh, Harrison, or or you're cheating? There's, I'm going to take your time. Here we go. It's your time. So just two things that I take away. Um, I'm interested in using uh, rigorously the social sciences to see if these interpretations of these spaces 
that I seem to have um, would show up in surveys and interviews afterwards, thanks to Elisabetta. And I would hope at some point um, the neuroscience folks might be able to also monitor it and see if there's a coincidence. And finally, I'm really interested in the linguistic issues that you started by having adjectives that describe certain experiences and seeing and paying attention to my adjectives to see how they fit in your cosmology. And then also interested, is there an embodied connection to those adjectives? Yeah, That's great. The 10% are over. Uh, so before I, I ask Michael, uh, can you pass the question to this side of the aisle here? If you have any question to this side or give it to the graduate student, that is uh, Matthew, he's picking it up. And then Andrea, can you pick it up? Where are you? Andrea? Can you, uh, and Andrea's picking up the other set. And then when you collect all of them, uh, give it to Yoshi. Michael? Well, there's no one theory of the brain and there's no one style of architecture. I agree with Graham that we need much richer descriptions of what we'd like to understand. I disagree that the tools are at hand. That's why we need a rich conversation, but I don't believe the conversation will be directly between detailed neuroscience and innovative architecture. I think we'll find a language um, in which we describe both conscious phenomena and unconscious phenomena and their interaction, uh, an enriched cognitive science that will act as the bridge between what can we learn about that level from the neuroscience and what can we challenge uh, from, from the architecture. And the final, well, the final points are that a lot of what's been said here has been about neuroscience in relation to architecture uh, in a very preliminary form without touching much on the sacred. And so my final challenge would be for Julio and I to reach agreement, and I'll put in a detail there. I, I've tried to suggest that we, we place religion in a historical perspective. And then the question is, what are the natural elicitors of human experience that led our ancestors to develop myths and religions? And then how can we tease apart the contribution from the, as it were, the natural inspirers of sacred awe and mystic experience and those that rest on specific traditions based on symbols and language? You got two minutes. He got extra. You're worth it. You got extra, I guess. Sarah? Well, I've, I came to this conversation originally because I'm very concerned about the body and interested in the body and the absence of the body in most design. And I think it's a rich way to engage, to un first to understand the body, our interaction with our environment. And I'm concerned that a lot of the techniques we're using are getting farther away from bodily experience than bringing us closer. And I think that, you know, there are other kinds of research that are valid besides scientific research in the, in the way we're doing it. And I would, I would point to artistic research. Most artists are not just making artifacts, they're engaged in a research process that has to do with the human imagination. And this has to be a complementary kind of endeavor. And I just want to underline that. Perfect. Um, so Julio, uh, in some ways, set us up for a near impossible task uh, in this conference. And there are three pools, which is neuroscience, theology, and architecture and trying to find the liminal spaces between these where the most interesting thing happens uh, at these interfaces, if we can actually communicate with each other. A couple of times through the, through the conference, the metaphor of everybody's touching different parts of the elephant has come up. But 
that presumes that there is a common element that we're all touching. And I would at least like to raise the possibility that some aspects of our disciplines may be incommensurate with the others. And knowing that is just as important as where the convergences are. One of the things that um, most impressed me about this conference is something that uh, uh, was just mentioned that is the, the you know the the Jaina parable of the blind man and the elephant the anek antavada no no single point of view and I think that was a great rich, richness of uh, this conference uh, very different points of view and even where they don't intersect um, for me one of the great benefits of this was to experience the uh, the deep humanity of all of you. Uh, it was it was just the, um, the the fact of the of the dialogue and of the positive commitment to questioning, even if not having answers. Uh, so I thought that that was one of the things that most impressed me. Another thing that was very impressive to me as someone who deals largely in the sphere of ideas was the the crucial need to get back to facts uh, and uh, to data. And secondly, along with that was my uh, impression that doing that is really, really difficult. Uh, and that's what you scientists are about. So thank you. Thank you, I love having the mic. Um, I'm going to, I have a lot to say in my short amount of time here, but, I want to emphasize the importance of language and understanding that when we're working across disciplines, we use words, conscious, unconscious, top down, bottom up, attunement even, right? Meaning making narrative that holds a space across disciplines and the value of thinking about and applying a range of methodologies to understand the human experience. There's no doubt that an experimental design and a neural variable is necessary for research in neuroscience. And if we really want to understand the lived experience of a person and how to actually apply the science to people, then we need more methods. And those do include those that come from the social sciences and constructivist methods, right? And so then I'll stop. <laughs> uh, Amir was part of the conference, so organization. So Amir has a, a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating, and especially Julio for uh, everything. And uh, I just, uh, I just think that uh, this we need more of these uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, researchers and uh, conferences and symposiums to uh, basically get uh, get all of the get all of us closer to what we're uh, what we're trying to do and uh, basically uh, and uh, sorry uh, I got a little bit stressed out and uh, sorry Julio I uh, no problem we love you. We love you. So I don't have 62 slides. So for me, a successful conference is one that spurs lots of thoughts. This has spurred a lot of thoughts. Um, Gordon talked about Shakespeare. That made me think about how Shakespeare, not just Proust, was a neuroscientist. He said, nothing there is, but thinking makes it so. That's neuroscience. Um, I want to say that Jonathan's work is music to my ears. Sorry to say it quite that way, but fantastic work. But mostly I just want to leave with a thought that came to my mind, which is that every moment rests on the shoulders of all the moments that preceded it. And that helps give us a perspective about what we're doing and the impact we have, but also that our thinking needs to be dynamic and we need to be flexible and ready to change and learn over time. That should be a quote from Alfred uh, Whitehead. He has exactly this. All right, one observation and one question that's still mulling in my mind. One observation 
uh, is that we've all observed studying people in architecture is a very complex business. And, and, and to do that and to do that well is, is seeing two different approaches. One, how can we simulate architecture advanced enough that we can understand it? Or how can we actually measure people in the wild or in the spaces? And we've seen both these angles come together. It was a keen observation to me to see that they're both struggling and neither is ahead of the race in the other. Uh, so as we look methodologically, we can maybe help each other, but also recognize there's not a winner at this point. And the one question that's still mulling in my mind is actually coming from Gordon Graham's talk today. You know, he, he gave us a suggestion at the end that imaginative genius provides insights and revealed insights revealed and expressed through art, right? Therefore, we can use art as evidential basis for generalizations about the life of the spirit. So as we begin to look at um, spiritual realities or life and spiritual realities, I guess my question still sits, is architecture fit that bill? Or does that work better in art or drama or music? How does architecture, can it be provide generalized insights? How can that, or does it um, fall within that category? That's good, thank you. Bobby? This is a criticism of my own research uh, project, and but I think it could apply to others as well. And something I worry about as an art historian is that we're working with manipulated images and uh, virtual spaces often. And I don't know if that's legitimate. I don't know what happens. And I, I find that my uh, colleagues in art are very concerned about the fact that we're not actually experiencing real art or maybe real spaces. And, and so there's something false perhaps in all of it. And I, I that's just a, a question I wanna raise. Um, it doesn't apply to everybody here, but it certainly applies to me. So I'll put it up. Thank you. Anne? What can I say? Um, this conference has really, I've never been to an architecture conference like this that brought so many people together talking about the ineffable and made it kind of front and center. That's really incredible. It made me think that the way I think may be limited. It made me realize that other people sometimes think my way, but use it in a different way. So it really expanded um, how I see architecture and also how I see myself. I think conversations like this, conferences like this are healing. And so I'm going to say, let's continue the conversation. <laughs> We're in game changing times. And uh, when's the next conference? Uh, my concluding quote is from a producer, Norman Lear. We will save our world, but when it is saved, I'm confident that the door will have been kicked open by things that bring us together, the arts. <laughs> Tom. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the disruption to my own thinking that has happened over the last several days. So I have an a observation, a question, and a surprise. My observation is that uh, what uh, the work that's been presented here, each of it comes out of a different situation, context, or project that are not easily reconcilable with each other. Um, and uh, that, that leads to a question. Can understanding better what appeals to or evasions of the sacred in each of our fields make possible uh, in our situations, can that help us bridge our differences? If we understand why we use the terms we use to deal with religion, spirituality, sacred theology, and what they're doing for us in our situations, would that help us better connect across differences? And then my surprise is, uh, given the very ambiguous histories in which all our fields are entangled, histories of oppression, coloniality, racism, and more, I was surprised, maybe even shocked, uh, that the integration of those ambiguous histories was not part of thinking about the future of this conversation. Um, so what I will take away, a new list of books, articles, scientific white papers, everything that I need to, to start reading, uh, what I will leave, maybe a question, um, why don't design schools teach uh, neuroscience for architects? My son is an artist and he, he got a Bachelor of Fine Arts and they had math for artists. And it was brilliant because it was math that could be applied to the arts without the complex functions that he really didn't need. So why don't design schools teach it as a natural part of the curriculum? Am I missing anybody? Yoshi, you want to say something or you're too busy? Probably you're too busy with that, huh? Busy, but I want to say. You won't say something. You won't say something. All right. Uh, well, so 
One of the things I noticed was lots of people talked about kind of like non-conscious processes that are involved in affecting the impact of whatever factor experimental manipulation you are doing on the behavior. And then sort of like, you know, that's, that's interesting and then that's good. Um, but then, uh, you know, we shouldn't fall into this uh, view of there's a conscious system and the unconscious system running in parallel and they don't talk to each other. Because after all, we are not conscious, uh, unconscious automata, you know, we are conscious beings. So even though as much as brain science or neuroscience would uh, elucidate non-conscious processes, I think you have to keep in mind the role of consciousness in generating human behavior and, and regulating human mind. So that's my five cents there. And then one other question was, uh, I wanna take a survey among this meeting participant uh, because there were several questions raised about what can, what can be done by architect who has uh, not skilled in doing a phenomenological inquiry. And then uh, there was no clear answer to that. But I wanna uh, raise question about uh, who among, among you know, this meeting participant, how many of you are actually uh, actively engaged in so-called contemplative practice? It could be meditation, it could be yoga, it could be Tai Chi or anything. Prayer, yes, contemplative prayer. So uh, I can't look around, but uh, you tell me, so is it like a, 70%, 90%, okay. Okay, so then that, that is, a, that's, the, that's the basis for, that, that could be a basis for answer because if the phenomenology is difficult to do, then uh, use the skill you gained from contemplative mind training as a sources for you know, doing phenomenology. So you do abuse your time. Yeah. Yeah. You totally abuse your time. Yeah, uh, exercise. Well, uh, you have you get then then censor it. You can read it. So just get out. Uh, just let me let me give you my one minute. Um, can I have a minute? Can I have a minute? Uh, why this is happening? You know, you had to put so much time. Why would you, right? So the reason I did this and uh, and I came to CUA, uh, and I think this came out. Uh, my the insight came out in my first sabbatical, he said, you know, in the end, I believe that the only thing worthwhile in life is, is spiritual growth. And I, I'm putting out there, and you don't need to agree with me. <laughs> so if a spiritualist growth is what it ultimately matters, and if, if architecture is something I love, how I connect the two, and then to me, it was natural that sacred space was the way to do it. Sacred space understood in a wide sense, not just religious space. Any space that allow you to enter in contact with something transcendental beyond yourself. Could be a divinity, or it could be nature, it could be uh, another human being, or it could be your deeper self. Anyway, so that's why we're here today, because somehow I believe that. I put all the time for, for us to have that conversation in whatever uh, fashion we wanted. I have to keep improvising now? Yeah, improvising. I mean, I think we just have to... What, I'm, I'm doing this a lot. All right. Any anybody any any part of the audience until we get uh, uh, you? This is five questions. You need to do all the questions to start with one. Okay. So, um, start with one. There was a question about. Start with one. Um, Just give it to me. No, no, no. You don't understand. It's not. Uh, Yeah, take, take this, take this, and then just, start just the door. No, no. <laughs> Yoshi, 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 Yoshi. That's my research partner. What can I do? All right. What does it, what does it say there? Okay, question number one. What about the poor? Good architecture, art, and music are expensive, but there are religious people who are not prosperous. Think of migrants from Latin America. That's uh, question number one. Question number two related. That that with the 
the uh, money poor, let's say, the material poor. But what about the cultural poor? Should the uh, sacred spaces be built on the criteria of what people like? This is often a different from what artists and musicians are considered, quote, good art or good music. Not that the clergy have little or no ascetic education. So one, what do we do for the, um, the poor of uh, material poor uh, or all the cultural poor? How does this relate to what we are doing here? Is this something we want to talk about? Anybody? I can just say that, that in the 40 school projects that my firm did while I was, while I was there, 30 something were for underserved students and underserved neighborhoods. And it just means that we have to be really clever at what we do because ultimately they're entitled to the same quality of architecture as anybody else. It just requires more skills and more dedication and more patience and more fighting with contractors about money. You have, you have something to say? I just said, uh, Milton gave us an example of that before. His diagram is still on the board that you can use lighting as a kind of architecture, uh, which would which would be adaptable to many spaces that I'm thinking of poor communities where, where I live on Long Island, rich part of the country with dirt poor communities, particularly of uh, Hispanic migrants. Um, something like you know the, the cleverness that Milton talks about of, of using lighting using other natural elements. I think that's something very much worth thinking about. I think uh, in my book, Transcending Architecture, uh, the ascetic is only one part of doing the good. Doing the good by itself is a spiritual practice. So uh, a home that uh, house the homeless is a spiritual practice. It's part of this, you know, for some of us, a sacred call. So I think that should be included. And the other answer I would have for the cultural poor, I think is the child, I think uh, religion should be both warming, um, what you call hom hominess, but also should be challenging. So I think there is room for uh, our home that doesn't challenge us. We want to be you know, hugged by our mother and take care, but also there is a space for challenging uh, arch architecture that actually doesn't follow necessarily what we expect. I think there is room for both. What's the next question? About this one. Are the question we are asking particular to the Western culture? modern culture, specifically with uh, regard to embodied space and sacred experiences or spiritual experiences. Many non-Western cultures have rituals that bridge space and body to create spiritual experiences that reinforce community. If so, um, what ha what, why we haven't talked about it? Anybody want to answer to that? This kind of underlines the point I tried to make earlier. I mean, you could say this is Western and modern, but there's a lot of anthropological study, a lot of anthropological description. It comes from many different cultures. It's out there, it's waiting, waiting to inform the understanding of the sacred, of the spiritual. And I think it really is a good starting place to look at careful observational study of all sorts of cultures, including our own, and then ask what is it amongst this that uh, neuroscience and neurophenology might illuminate. So it, it, we may not have heard much about other cultures here, but there's plenty of material and historically as well as anthropologically, if you, if you want it. Any other one to respond here? Okay. And Jan. Um so, um, so this is, since I care about words, I just, uh, this is something I hammer into people in my lab is to try to avoid using notions like Western and non-Western, because it marks Western in a certain way. And in that context, Western doesn't include indigenous arts in, um, in the Americas. It doesn't include Central America, it doesn't include Mexican art, which is North American art. Uh, and 
non-Western is lumped as though it's one thing and the sort of traditions in uh, in India, in Japan, in China, in the Middle East, uh, in Northern Africa are vastly different. Uh, and so uh, it just it's just one of my pet peeves of, of framing things as Western and non-Western that, that uh, conflates a whole lot of very rich and diverse traditions. Thank you, Anja. Okay, here's one for the neuroscientist. So wash my hands here. How do the neuroscientists think they can help us to build better worlds? Michael has an answer for this, I'm sure. You're typing to avoid a question or? No, no, I'm taking notes on all these fine, uh, fine comments. Uh, I, I think you're on your own. I, I think it's hopeless. Um, I mean, look, when I was born, when I was born, there were 2 billion people in the world. There are now 8 billion people in the world. Uh, somebody said, well, there are more hands to solve the problems. I just think there are more bellies to take resources. So I think it's hopeless. Um, I think in about 50 years, there will be a population collapse with climate change. And then the world's population will crash to a billion or two. And there won't be any resources to support work in basic science. And you'll be on your own to try and figure out how to build a decent world on the ruins. I'm not sure I believe that, but I thought it was a controversial thing to say. Uh, unfortunately, that's a scenario that is not out of the, the question, right? That's uh, our job to avoid. Uh, I'll try to be a bit more optimistic uh, in answering this. Yeah. <laughs> um, how can neuroscientists help uh, architects in designing, I suppose, right? So I think that there is a couple of in interesting principles that we can share with each other. The first one being that um, neuroscience, in my opinion, becomes ex especially interesting when we talk about uh, non-conscious processes. This is something we can measure, and this is something that we all find very, very interesting. So this is something that neuroscientists explicitly are interested in and also architects. So this is like common ground. Uh, the second one would be uh, sensory motor dynamics, simply because, well, you have sensory neurons and you have motor neurons. And essentially, uh, philosophy, psychology, embodied cognition, uh, radical embodied cognition and so on will uh, basically promote the idea that all cognition and experience of the world is sensory motor bound. So in that case, if you want to understand human experience and cognition and behavior, well, then uh, an embodied cognition of neuroscience is the way to go. So in that case, I think that neuroscience can inform architecture in plenty of ways. Thank you. Anybody else? Any, uh... All right, another question. We have seen the, da the data gathered that is uh, uh, proven. Okay, we've seen that data gathered uh, in science uh, is proving that sacred space impact the brain. How does that lead to applicable architectural factors like those shown in the last panel? So sacred architecture factors that have a neurological impact can be integrated into modern design to further the connection to the sacred. You know, one good question, I think I would say, and I, I believe in this this this, this uh, question, I, I am kind of there, like I believe that architecture, any architecture should be um, subversive and actually uh, point at the ineffable, uh, even in, in supermarkets. I, I, I believe that. I know that is questionable. I think uh, the, the, the problem that Michael is pointing out, which I think is our most of our mind, some of us will be there before that, so we are lucky, but uh, most of the students will have to leave that. The only way to solve them, in my understanding, is through spiritual growth. It will be not done through more matter, more stuff, more energy. You have to go deeper. So that's why I think that the role of architecture to me is subversive in the sense of embedding clues so people are in the middle of the supermarket get some sense of transcendence. Okay, that's what this, the question is, really. So. Um, if you don't agree with that, please, or or some other version of that, or any version of that, um, you want to say anything? 
recirculation loss to, to, to say what I just said, but I'm gonna get in trouble. I mean, what you said, but maybe they are all related to these three questions. Yeah, that's, how can we create transcendent spaces into everyday secular spaces informed by science and secret architecture understanding? I guess it's similar. How do we unpack the mystical and the sense of unity and bring science and creativity and, and art together? It's a kind of tough question to answer. Anybody has any insight on that? Too, too complicated. Yeah, give me some good question, Joshi. Just give me some good question. I mean, look, I mean, like, I, I just came in to give me some good questions. I mean, I mean, I get in trouble. I mean, it's not my fault I give him bad questions. <laughs> when is the next conference? I mean, no, I'm not organizing, I tell you that. Yeah. Uh, if I can comment, I, I, I think the grain of these questions is much too large. You know, no, nobody's sort of getting onto a specific. Uh, what, what is it if, if an experimentalist, I mean, as we've seen, Elisabetta and Zach both gave us very well-focused experiments. So the challenge is, can, we artic can you as an architect, let's say, articulate an issue where you could imagine there are just a few variables whose relationship you'd like to understand and perhaps how they vary with people's different background. So for example, it occurred to me in listening to Li Ching Chang that we needed a post-exit questionnaire that really tried to probe at the phenomenological level what different strategies people used in probing their space because it didn't make sense to lump all those fancy EEG models of all the subjects if, in fact, some were employing very different ways of feeling sacred, even though they all felt it. And so I, I really think that the questions each person should be asking themselves at the moment is, what is there in my architectural practice that I stay up nights over and where I, I really think it's focused enough. There are a few key variables I'd like to understand. There's a well-defined context. Um, what might an experiment be in that context? And then is there any way of stepping back? Might there be a general answer that could apply to what lots of architects are worrying about, not just what I'm worrying about? Now, as a, I'm not the architect, so I can't formulate those questions for you. But I think the real value that will come out of the next conference, which Julio will find someone to organize instead, uh, will be to come up with these sort of very specific challenges. That's well said, I think. I think the challenge, I think, is not so come up with big ideas, but how to test them, how to put under the fire of experimentation. That's it's incredibly hard to do. I think, Anja, you refer to that and then you are again. And I think the, the, the success, I think, of, of, of the thing that uh, both uh, Elizabeth and, and uh, Zach um, was that the, the, it's, it's, it's very controlled and, and, and you could begin to answer important question with very controlled experiment. The critique to my uh, research and probably Rob's, Robin's uh, self-criticism, uh, I guess, self-criticism mine, he said, uh, mine is so complex. At one point, it's very hard to, to control uh, for for so many variables. So how you do that, or in your case, you know, uh, the, is virtual enough, good enough? But I think these are, I think, there are moments to me, uh, I think this is also go back about, about your point about, um, you know, you should, you know, put your hypothesis beforehand and then see what, what comes out rather than, you know, go fishing, right? Um, I think I have gone fishing, and I I I, I totally acknowledge that, uh, and I think I say that uh, in in whatever publication I will have. I think right now we don't know enough, right? And I think if you are honest about the exploration, uh, and you put it as such, we are exploring, and then the next there's a pilot study uh, in the next in the next one, which then I will do that. I will do in the next one that gamma uh, band will I expect that, but right now I mean we couldn't do that because there isn't. 
I mean, you're just shooting in the dark. Uh, so there is a problem with that. But then at the beginning, you do the beginning. It's kind of the chicken and egg. But I think that's a that's another issue that I think um, that we are confronting. That we are at kind of almost ground zero in at some level. I mean, not not much because you know you yourself have done plenty. But but still, right? So how you start uh, the, the 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 design of experiments and questions that could be falsifiable? How you do that? So I have a question just uh, following up on what Robin was thinking about, that in neuroscience, do you guys imagine that sometime from your VR models, you would move into a real world space model? Is that the hope? Or do you really think you're going to stay in the VR model? Like, for instance, I would love to see Elisabetta's experiment in real life, in IRL. Go from one to the other, do this, see it, because... As architects, we know that that has a different affect than being in VR, and so does everybody else. So I'm just curious, is the hope that the way we're starting now is the baby steps towards really doing something in the physical level, or are we just thinking that we continue science in this way? Um, thank you so much uh, for your question. Yeah, it's just a baby step, in my opinion, toward that. Um, direction. So, for example, during my PhD studio um, research, um, I had an actual corridor. My dad helped me to build a corridor. Yeah, <laughs> he came to the architecture department, and in a weekend, we built the, the corridor. Um, in this experiment, why we are working with reality? There are many, many reasons. One of those is that um, we are testing maybe too many technologies at the same time, because since there are not so many studies before us, we are not sure what is the most promising like physiological measure or technique. So I'm quite sure that after this experience, we can get rid, for example, of eye tracking or some of the sensors and make our experience step-by-step step the most natural as we can. Because so far it wasn't very natural. We were in a very warm lab uh, room. I was so happy to have that. So I will always be grateful to Kansas State, but it wasn't the best place ever. Arms lean, the ad set, someone um, close to you because there were, there were cables. So it's just a baby step. Thanks. Can I just add a few things to that? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Uh, I think that uh, personally, the dream is to go into the wild. But um, I think that um, practically speaking, for me, it doesn't make sense to start in the wild because I don't know what I'm looking for. So if I start in the lab under controlled conditions, I get a response, I get a marker, I get a, a very robust hypothesis, then I know what I'm looking for, then I can slowly try to trans transition into into the wild. So this is more like, uh, I guess, a scientific strategic decision uh, one has to make, um, especially if you're such an experimentalist as myself, you really want to just be sure about what you're doing every time. Um, but I guess also that during my presentation, I showed the uh, VSLAM um, algorithm. That's a huge, in my opinion, a landmark for future of, uh, of architecture and neuroscience, because in that case, we can synchronize all kinds of matters with the environment being being it in in the lab or in the wild and that's a huge step i, I think so most likely in the yeah next few years maybe we might be able to do something I mean, it would be great if we as architects could convince our clients to sort of set space aside to do this kind of thing together in every project you know um uh, so our my colleague sarah williams goldhagen um and i were talking about doing this like biophilic testing like do a real lounge and do a digital lounge and then check it would be great to be able to do that, but I guess it takes some convincing. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. Anjan, uh, so Anjan first, and then you go, uh, Richard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I didn't uh, present any of this because it's not, uh, it's still, still in progress, but we have done exactly uh, Suchi, what you're suggesting, and mostly for us to understand the correspondences. So we did a set of experiments in a in a real room, biophilically designed, 
And now the two arms off of that are we've recreated that room in a VR environment and we're doing the same experiments out in nature, right? If this is biophilic, let's do it in the in actual nature. And so part of for us, the question is, what are the behavioral uh, correspondences? Because if the VR environment uh, approximates what we are finding in the real room reasonably well, it's a huge boon because then we can start manipulating that uh, because as you know, the, the manipulating the real environment requires a lot of resources in a way that in a VR environment, it, it doesn't quite the same way. And so our goal, if this correspondence happens is we can tweak the VR environment before we go back to the real environment to make the next set of manipulations. But I don't know if, if the, how well the, these, uh, the results are gonna correspond. Some kind of place where information like this comes together. I have been published. But it was also because usually you find you guys, you guys will... this is not working. You're not, <laughs> you're not following orders. <laughs> Go ahead with the question. No, 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 just, uh, just, just no. Sorry, uh, just to say that because uh, so we have a lot of unpublished uh, experiments, but usually that's because either, well, the number of N is just simply too low or the novelty is not too interesting enough for us even wanting to that publish it. So I, I have to personally admit that that kind of study for us was not so surprising because there are tons of studies showing the relationship between the reality and VR. So what novelty are we bringing into it actually, you know, nothing really. And then in the scientific community, personally, I wouldn't want to, to publish stuff like that. So I guess this is something uh, bad, bad uh, scientist uh, personality trait that you don't always want to uh, publish all your data. You just sometimes want to be careful. So I guess that's, yeah, I don't know. No, no. I have to follow some order here. Come out, come out, you. Unless it's related, it's related? Sorry, Matthew, just, uh... all right. Just following up on this, but uh, what uh, uh, Anjan was saying, uh, how do you control for the multiple factors of change that occur in the natural world, like humidity, sounds, time of day, when you're doing the VR, because there's, I mean, you can duplicate each one of them maybe, but there are so many factors. And when you have multiple factors changing at once. We can, we can, we can right? Can so we, we can't recreate it completely and certainly not all of the sensory modalities and time of day and all of that, right? And when we take it out into nature, there's even more variability because that's not the same as a biophilic room, even if a biophilic room is inspired by nature, but is nature better? And then you have all kinds of variables of what kind of nature, right? So there, it's impossible uh, to control all of these variables but for us, it's, is it good enough? And the answer might be no, it's not good enough, right? And then we're not gonna continue with this line of work. But if it's good enough, then at least it starts to give us an approximation. Yeah, I'm moving. Uh, where were the... Carison, to, to wait, <laughs> to wait. Uh, Matthew goes, no, you, you, were, you were first. Is that related to the to the question? Is it related? So something something that that continues to trouble me uh, quite a bit is the is the difference between designing an experiment that is focused enough to be replicable and and walk away with clear evidence in a in a subject like architecture which is in some ways like music has timber timbre rather has a wholeness to it which is hard to dissect i'm just curious if anyone knows how 
neuroscience approaches that kind of comprehensive experience like music and whether there's any possibility of taking that approach methodologically into looking at architectural experience, which also has tamper. Do you have a question or an answer? When you were comparing the VR and the and the real spit and you know the wild, what were you what were you measuring? Were you using your uh, taxonomy? Those uh, kind of yeah. So wait, wait, wait. So we uh, we measured uh, not the final taxonomy, but in this case, sort of how we arrived at coherence, fascination, and hominess. So that we're measuring across all of them, and then we have measures of attention. Uh, we have tests of attention, and we have uh, assessments of uh, mood, anxiety, and then we had some creativity measures uh, that are often used in laboratory settings. So those are the set, those those are the set of measures we're doing across uh, each of those uh, settings. You're doing it by questionnaires? Well, some of them are questionnaires and some of them are the kind of experiments you might do on a computer. So the attentional experiments are things you do on a computer. The creativity ones are things that are used commonly for divergent tasks, for example. Uh, so, um, you know, and and every the, the, there's a lot of literature claiming that these environments help with this sort of thing, and we're not sure it does, or at least in the way that we measure it, whether it will or not. Just that I think that you might find interesting information in the research of music therapists that give some insights into pitch and timbre and how the different ways that the music can be played or listened to or engaged with certain patient populations compared to non-clinical populations provide some insights. So one thing, if you wait uh, until you have all the conditions for a perfect experiment, it will never start. Um, it's like, you know, as an architect, you try to do the perfect building, you will never have one. So, I mean, that's, although I, I just criticize my, my approach, I think at least it start. So, and I think it's just technology is changing fast. And we are learning a lot of these, these things. So we have to be prudent and humble, but had to have courage. Just wanted to provide a comment to the question that was originally in Julio's paper. Uh, as a design professor, I presume some students asked this, I feel the design angst, right? That, oh, how do I do this? Uh, teaching that all the time. And I, I wanna encourage you that there are wonderful lists of design tactics that have developed by this man back here, myself, that are published. And these are not necessarily invalid. We don't have to wait for science to say, this is how it is. And maybe I'll employ some of uh, Graham Gordon's thoughts here that, you know, these, these lists of design tactics for transcendent or sacred space uh, have emerged uh, out of generalizations of life of the spirit or generalizations of theology. Uh, and in that can speak to a lot of the validation that, that they exist. Um, and certainly they need help and validation from science, but there is some validity to what's there and they are they do exist out there. Well, you can look at, and that's what Anne, uh, you talk very much, Architecture is evolutionary, right? At least, let's say just a particular culture because cultures are different. Like the, 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 the plan of the church, for instance, the basilica has been evolving for what? Since the fourth century, right? Until now. So there is some sort of proof of responses of, 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 of generations and generations. And they do change, like in, in talking about music with Jonathan, the music of the 16th century is not like this, but there is some sort of responses that the reason this things continue to be built, not just because dogma is there, it's because somehow it works. Now, why it works, we don't quite understand, and that's what we are studying some of this. Similar with traditional architecture, they have evolved, and uh, perhaps the argument would be, well, you cannot build in the 21st century like you, you built in the 6th century, which fair enough. But I think there is some indication that some of these things have been try and error, and it survives and continue to be built. Perhaps uh, there is some, some, some lessons to be taken from there. Any other question? I have another question from Yoshi, but well, not from Yoshi, but uh, 
how do you train the next generation of, of uh, researchers, scholars, or architects on this? We just got to do with your question, your, your answer there. Anybody want to say any more on that? Well, first you want the students to be here, right? <laughs> and uh, clearly there is not much of interest, clearly. So, um, yeah, maybe there's not a lot of interest. So somebody was talking yesterday um, that, who was telling me this, that you can only learn and teach the one that want to learn. You cannot, you cannot uh, do that otherwise. So perhaps there is no interest, which would be tragic, but is what it is. Who has, who has, who has, uh, anybody has? Hey, do you have? That's a related question. So, how do, how, how do you train new generation researchers in Scarab? Then, related question is uh, how do you uh, seek funding to support this yeah. type of research? Yeah. Or this type of dialogue? Uh, My voice is big enough, so it's okay. So, um, how do you find the funding or sponsor to support this type of interdisciplinary effort? And then it's not it's not the easy, uh, you know. Question yeah, funding, money. <laughs> How you get money to do this? I mean, that's the biggest question. I mean, Yoshi and I did arguably the first fMRI in architecture, one of the few first one in 2010, 11, and we've we waited. I mean, how many how many years to get the chance with TRT and T, and not for lack of grant proposals, frankly. And until you know, template don't came and save save the day. But you know, how many places? And you you're a you're a miracle uh, that you are. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's it's, it's your talent. I don't want to say it's, it's luck, right? But you, you, it's but it's like incredible. You have your lab going. I mean, it's, it's like in in a capitalist society where it doesn't necessarily value this kind of thing. How you keep this effort? Uh, and that's a big issue uh, um, that, you know, going to Suchi's question of how you get it going. Yes. I have, I have a question for the architects in the room, which is by definition, the architects are here because you're interested in this. But are you unicorns in the world of architecture? Are you strange, a strange beast? Uh, like, I'd like to get a sense of it from just a broader perspective of architecture. Uh, where this kind of thinking is situated. Take that. Yeah, I'm going to let out. So it's a great question. And I think maybe there are not a lot of architects who've been curious and looked to neuroscience to try to understand better what they believe makes uh, space meaningful and you know arouses fascination and you know you keep in your memory. Um, there are a lot of ideas that architects put forward for how that happens, but um, and teaching is usually done through precedents where they think you can take students to a building and they can feel these things. Um, but I don't think there are a lot that, you know, are like John Eberhard. And I think in part, it was because a lot of the early stuff that happened out of neuroscience <clears throat> just seemed to be so irrelevant, you know, that they were, drawing impossible conclusions and it didn't make sense. But I think there's a huge progress and um, it was great to be here to see the various ranges of ways in which um, people doing the experimental work are interrogating these questions. And, um, you know, I'm a, I've been a, an academic administrator and and taught at Princeton, which was heavily into, you know, formal artistic theory. Um, uh, Minnesota, another place. Penn, I taught there for three years. Carnegie Mellon, which was entirely interested in environmental technology. So 
Uh, and architecture certainly had an amazing phase when it was interested in architecture as a form of semiotics. And I'm sure you're aware of that. So um, it's architects are kind of chameleons. They're searching for understanding their art better. And um, I, I would encourage the my my faculty. I don't have any faculty anymore. I'm retired, um, but I would encourage my friends who are still part of the academy to pay attention to this. That I think there are some really interesting things that are coming out. So yes, we are, uh, you know, not normative. That's what but you're asking. Ampa has played a big deal in this. Ampa has really done quite a bit. I'm going to do you, and then well, maybe you haven't said anything. Sorry. Hi, I'm going back to the question on how do you teach this, which was a couple people ago. Um, I am not a teacher, but I graduated here two years ago. And what was fascinating about this lecture is seeing what I learned in university, reviewing it and realizing how much of it I use in the profession now over the past two years. And while I may not be a teacher, I've learned from Milton, Julio, and the staff here. And I can tell you that what they teach works. So look for them for how to teach it, because what they're doing, they're doing it right. Um, OK, and that's, that's propaganda. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Uh, <laughs> I like to be paid. Yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 I like hearing that. Thank you. Um, I think it's a question of mainstreaming. And sometimes the way you mainstream is to show the advantages broadly enough that people say, yeah, I want to do some of that. So I think that comes down to actual techniques that can be used in practice. But in terms of us being sort of on the outside of the profession, I gave a talk one time at a national AIA conference, and they gave me 7 a.m. on the first day of a four-day conference. A lot of people hadn't even arrived. 300 architects showed up for the talk. They didn't know me. It was, they knew it was about, had something to do with neuroscience and architecture. I think there's a considerable hunger in the profession to learn more. And that we know that our intuition's great, but it needs to be sharpened. It needs to be rejuvenated with new information and new ideas and the pro and the outcomes from science. I think there's a real hunger and I think mainstreaming is possible. He, he wants to say, I'm here, so I'm gonna put somebody in the spot. Um, no, you said I'll go, I'll walk there, but I think I want to hear from the theologians because I mean, that's a big thing. Um, that's this conversation you're a kind guy, you came because, you know, kind of, we, we work together. But um, does it matter for you and Richard, I will get closer and ask him, you know, is this something that theologians care? Especially, you know, you know, can you say something about that? Thank you, Julio. So, I, you know, given where I come from, my ears are very attuned when we're talking about theology, spirituality, sacrality, and there's kind of a whole um, constellation of terms that, go together here, and how people come into what those terms mean for them is very interesting to me. So uh, I've really benefited from listening to how those terms are deployed. And so being influenced by hermeneutics and, and pragmatism, I'm always interested in what kind of work those terms do in different contexts. And I need to know more about that to understand the significance they have across the range of uses that we've seen here. But in terms of my own teaching, uh, you know, to this question, I've been in theology for almost 30 years in three different, working in three different Jesuit universities, and there's never been a course on architecture and theology in any university in which I've taught. And I think I should create one at Fordham, kind of inspired by this conversation. And I think it should, but you know, even in the regular theology courses, quote unquote regular ones, people are talking, people make reference to brain research all the time now. People make reference to, uh, what happens in different um, temples, mosques, uh, churches, etc. So I'm really thinking curriculum as I'm sitting here, especially uh, on this last day, 
and how can, uh, and I'm right now the director of our PhD program in religion, uh, how can we train a new generation of theologians to uh, be a little more conversant with the expertise in this room uh, that I have been really inspired by. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get there. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to jump in. That. I'll just follow up. Um, I do teach a course for theologians and divinity students in architecture and liturgy PhDs, which I think is really important. And in my past uh, life, I ran a summer program in religion and the arts in which we had architects learning about theology um, and liturgy. So there was, there's a place for that. And there's a place for us to talk with each other about that. And I, one other quick story, my daughter who went to the University of Minnesota and began her MARC program called me on the phone. And some of you heard me tell the story and she said, mom, we're going on a retreat. <laughs> and they took the whole first year MARC students on a retreat. And I said, um, and where are you going? And she said, we're going to a monastery. And I said, oh, I know where you're going. You're going to Collegeville, <laughs> where there's a Marcel Breuer chapel. And that's why you're going there. But I think we could learn from each other about the ways that we should be talking. Um, because there's lots for architects to learn about theology. There's a lot for theologians to learn about architecture. I just use it like this. You can hear me. Uh, could I go back to the question regarding uh, practice yes. and whether we are unicorns in the field? So I am um, going to confess, I work for a large corporate firm. I'm an architect. Um, but I've been involved in this conversation for several years. Now what I'm finding is that our clients, which sometimes are uh, range from, you know, um, higher ed, like universities, colleges, but also very corporate clients, there's a very heightened awareness about how to design spaces so that people, for example, will be willing to come back to work in this post-COVID era. Yeah. There's a lot of scare that there's tons of square footage of commercial space sitting out there that's gonna stay vacant. So there's a problem they're trying to solve. It's not an interest. They're trying to solve a problem that they have. And so that's fine. But so behind that means that there, there is attention to it. There probably is funding around research that's going to make those spaces designed in such a way that they foster community, that they foster um, you know, more creativity, um, that they attract the employees back to the office, et cetera. So there are commercial incentives behind the fundamentals of this question here. How does space and environments, how do space and environments affect people? So I'm seeing it on that side and I'm also seeing it um, on the side of um, the question of equity, um, uh, design and equity, equity and design, um, where we're hearing more about um, whether design is for the 1% that can afford it and appreciate it or whether, which I don't believe in, uh, but that is the general idea that you know design and architecture is something nice to have if you can afford. It's starting to shift where people are starting to understand that actually <laughs> spaces impact you and can have a very negative impact on you if they're not designed in a particular way that is an informed design. And so then it becomes a question of equity. It's the 99%. Um, that's all I have to say. Is this open? Okay. So uh, I handed this question to Julio, but then I guess nobody answered, but uh, I, I wanna give it a try, okay? So the uh, how can we unpack the mystical and the sense of unity and so on? So, how do you study the mystical state of awareness? Well, uh, I think it, it, it's becoming possible to empirically track the states of consciousness when subjects are undergoing very uh, drastic alternation of consciousness. Example would be psychedelic uh, states of consciousness. And then nowadays, there are many studies going on. And then there are tools available to uh, uh, track 
the states of consciousness, non-ordinary states of consciousness. So as I indicated uh, sometime during the symposium, you know, I'm interested in something called non-dual non awareness. So that uh, uh, there's a sort of uh, dissolution of subject object uh, 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 distinction, you know, so that uh, that melts away, but still you are there and then et cetera and so on. So when we talk about the neurophenomenology and, and uh, sacred uh, space, I think you know that that's what I really want to take a look at, and then I think we have a tool to do that. So just because something is ineffable, and then usually mysticism has been defined as all these different features, one of them is ineffable. Because if it's ineffable, how can you study that? But I think I would beg to disagree with that assessment, and then I think you can measure it. And if you're interested in using questionnaire to measure non-dual state, non-dual trait and non-dual state of awareness, you can talk to me and I can uh, direct you to the psychometric tool available in the public domain, so. Gordon has a comment. I don't want to disagree with you too fiercely, but uh, there is something odd to my ear in the expression unpacking the mystery or the mystical. Um, and I just want to say that uh, certainly there is a strand of thought that regards the mysterious as not a special experience, but rather a limit to experience. So that you encounter the mystical when you encounter the limits uh, to experience. And uh, of course, in many uh, mystical practices, uh, that is precisely why uh, that is the point of silence. So that uh, you, uh, it's an important aspect of it that you give up on uh, the determination to say or to describe or to capture within some uh, framework. So I don't say that um, there isn't data, and I certainly I can believe that, uh, but I'm a little anxious about this, that when you say to people, now, I want you to step in here and tell me how you feel, or how the building affects you, or how a piece of music affects you, and they give you, uh, they give you a story. And then you say, um, perhaps you, check out what the brain is doing at the time. But then you say, ah, so that's what's happening when people have mystical experiences. But at least one very long standing and I think very important tradition uh, in mysticism precisely refuses uh, to express or to capture uh, in words and phrases and uh, is emphatic that before a mystery, let us say, the mystery of Christ on the cross, you stand in silence. That's what it requires. So I think there, there is at least one conception of the mystical that simply isn't going to fit into this. And there's always the danger that when you come out and tell me all the interesting stuff about brains and everything else, you're not actually talking about mysticism, but something else, some, some affective state. Well, I think the... Um... Silence, actually, uh, now I can't remember exactly how many years ago this, but there was a, some uh, workshop held, organized by this researcher from Israel, and they had a, some kind of uh, retreat, uh, week-long retreat on silence. So they meditated, and also they discussed the science uh, needed to understand the phenomena of silence. You know, the, what does it mean to have this silence and so on. So, if you say there's a tradition where they, they do not uh, acknowledge that uh, whatever they're doing is outside of empirical investigation. I mean, that's the end of discussion, I suppose. But uh, to the extent I think, you know, uh, you make a progress by looking at the phenomena. So if you say, like, don't, don't come, you know, this is, this is mystical state and it's beyond the reach of any systematic investigation. I mean, my definition of science is pretty loose. So any kind of systematic inquiry, you know, disciplined, you know, sort of inquiry directed at some phenomenon, 
that, that's scientific to me. So if you are saying like this, this is outside of that kind of effort, you know, you can't come here, go away, then maybe I go somewhere else and to study that, study some, whoever may agree to be studied, right? Or, I just, I, let, let me just make one more comment about this and, and, and don't want to uh, go on too long. But I, I, as a philosopher, I believe that I'm engaged in systematic study, but it's not a systematic study of an empirical kind. And as a matter of fact, I, I have written a paper about uh, mystery and the mystical, but the attempt to grasp the concept of mystery it, and can be done more or less systematically with the right kind of um, analysis and uh, argumentation. All I'm saying is, is, with this I stop, if it is true that mystery marks the limit of experience and that indeed encountering the mystical is encountering the limits of experience, any research program that is intended and hoping to capture uh, the distinctiveness of that experience is going to be impossible. But I don't say that puts an end to systematic study. Because, uh, hey, I think I'm engaged in systematic study. Yes, sir. No. Okay. Five minutes left, so. um, real quickly, I just wanted to go back to... Um, is this capture? Are we unicorns in the room? The architects. I'm an architect, um, but also an educator. And I think 20 years ago, yeah, it, we would definitely be more of the unicorns in the room. Um, 10 years ago, it's slowly catching on. Um, five years ago, even more so. And I think there's this exponential growth in popularity with the bridge between neuroscience and architecture. Um, case in point, you know, we, we've heard a lot of, uh, you know, some of those that are uh, practicing in large commercial firms and others nationwide, there's uh, architecture firms that are creating a research arm. Um, and I think, lo and behold, evidence-based design is becoming more of a practice um, in the profession. Now, real quickly, as an educator, right, how do you incorporate this into the curriculum? I think there's a couple of ways. Um, one is we're dealing with science, the neuroscience. How does that get into architecture? That's number one. Number two, the other problem is how do you get the sacred and religious architecture or sacred architecture into the curriculum, which usually it's held at bay. This is a subject we do not talk about. Um, so there's kind of two nuances, I think, there. And in terms of curriculum, if you can get it into your core curriculum in architecture, then that's, that's, a, that's a route. Um, I, I teach at Utah Valley University, and we've created a course called Culture and Behavior in Architecture, where we dive into the neuroscience side of things. And that's, that's one way. All students have to take that. And eventually, it trickles out into the profession. Right, but then how do you deal with the sacred? And that's that's a whole other question. Um, I wanted to go back to the funding aspect to just um, a American Society of Interior Designers. As long as I've been an interior designer, um, has been giving grants away every year, large grants to do this kind of research. So. Um, the money is out there. Um, I have vendors that come to me with information on research. Hayworth was doing um, a lot of research. You can set up studies through Armstrong. Armstrong has done their own research. There's a lot of stuff out there. You just have to really dig for it. I think there's more than you think. Uh, the Journal of Interior Design has been doing studies for years, and they have um, just loads of books that um, are just studies on um, uh, uh, information um, that interior designers have gleaned from their specific work and it's been published in these books. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. You just have to dig, it just takes time. Yeah. I think that's the end of the session. Um, I think I'm, I'm hungry and anyway, so, um,
Thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you, Yoshi. Thank you, Nick and Matthew and Paula. And thank you, uh, Amir, and certainly Lorenzo. Thank you, Lorenzo. Here's a... Um, let's, uh, let's remember, um, let's remember this time as we go in our own paths of where we accomplished together or didn't accomplish. And uh, let's hold that to our own uh, path to where we need to go so we continue um, growing and uh, help others, okay? Thank you, and we'll see you at the party. That's what you Thank you. Thank you for uh, supporting the yeah, 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 yeah.